listeners and readers of awardswatch.com. This is the Awards Watch Podcast, episode 254. I'm your executive. Or I'm, yeah, I'm your executive editor, Ryan McQuaid. I didn't even remember my title there today. <laughs> um, joining me is Karen Peterson. Hello. And Dan Bayer. Let's pump it up, baby. You gotta pump it up. Uh, it's been in my head for weeks now. Uh, like it's it. Yeah, there is two songs rivaling um my headspace. It's that, and there's a song in Anora. I don't know. Neither one of you have seen Anora yet, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a Thanks song. Thanks for rubbing that, it in. I'm yeah. not. <laughs> I'm seeing wow. it Monday at NIF. I'm t- I'm hopefully. just I'm not trying to rub it in. I was just I was just asking. It. I don't know what you guys see in your screenings and <laughs> and during your time. I mean, Dan, you were at Tiffit Plate there. You, you, you follow know I mean? us on Twitter. You know what we see. I <laughs> let you guys live your lives, and then it's fun to come on these shows and talk about it later. Anyway, we're not talking about Anora. That's in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're here to talk about the substance which is uh, the film that everybody's talking about right now. And we're going to do a, a we're just going to do a simple review of, of, of a movie that, that really didn't like, uh, you know, it's got not that much to talk about. So it'd be pretty quick, right guys. Um, and, uh, but first I do want to talk about the other film that released this weekend. Uh, and that is uh, transformers one, our own Karen Peterson, did the review up on the website, Karen? I was so shocked by the reaction to this thing. This thing is like a critical hit, and hey. people people love this thing. I was shocked by my own reaction to this movie. I was shocked by your <laughs> being shocked of your own reaction. <laughs> well, it's really funny because I got invited to the screening, and I was just like, "Eh, whatever. I'm probably not going to go to that." And even the day that it happened. I had a lot going on and I thought, oh, maybe I just won't make it. And then I just thought, you know, I'll just I'll just go check it out. Why not? Take one for the team. Do the review. Yeah. And well, and I wasn't even doing the review yet. It was just I'll just go see it, I guess. Why not? Mm -hmm. And I just in the opening few minutes of it, I went, wow, the I was so impressed by the animation and um so right off the bat that really hit me just how well designed and how crisp and and just really just beautiful it was Mm -hmm. and getting to be introduced to a very different version of a much younger version of the characters that we've known since the 80s some of us are old enough to remember watching that on tv after school (laughs) amen Um, yeah and um it it yeah it it's just it's really fun it's very funny i was not ex- i don't know why i wasn't expecting it to be as funny as it was i've i again i watched the cartoon when i was a kid and i really enjoyed the first of the michael bay movies just as a this is a fun nostalgic throwback but i've not liked pretty much any of the movies that have followed so for th- for this one to be as good as it was, as funny as it is, um, and just a really good story, because basically this is sort of an origin story of how Optimus Prime became Optimus Prime and how Megatron became Megatron. And um, they started off as best friends, as close as brothers, and just watching their their story unfold and kind of what really happened to lead to this huge rift between them. It was really well developed. And I thought, you know, this is, this is the type of thing that if they're going to make origin stories, they need to do more of this where it's not, doesn't feel like it's just about money. It really feels like they have a story to tell and they really took the time to tell it well. So. Yeah. It's from, uh, it's from Josh Cooley. It who, um, which I was, I was kind of shocked. Um, Josh Cooley, who did Toy Story Four, was with Pixar for seventeen years. He was there from 03 to twenty twenty. Was a a lot working a lot as a storyboard artist. He did like work on The Incredibles, the first car, or first couple car movies, Ratatouille. Up. He wrote Inside Out, I think. He wrote. He co wrote Inside Out um, because Pete Doctor will say he did it, but no others did it as well. Um, and um, and yeah and he was uh nominated for an oscar there and uh i guess 
yeah, he wins the Oscar right for animated feature. Um, yeah, for yeah, Toy for Story, Toy Story 4. 4. And then he left, and then he's he's been working over here. I haven't seen the film yet. I just wanted to get Karen's thoughts on it since it was the big, it was one of the film's big releases from the weekend. Um, but I'm really excited to see what he does. And I mean, <laughs> I was kind of chuckling a little bit at the way you were describing that, Karen, not from your description and the way you did it, but from what the film sounds like it is, which sounds exactly like the story that they're trying to sell us for a little bit from Mufasa that we're going to see later this year, <laughs> <laughs> um, which, yeah. is, which is very interesting. Um, so, and it's usually always the movie that is the first one to get out of the gate with a story like that, that doesn't have to have those comparisons. Um, and that movie has unfair expectations, I believe on its shoulders. And this one has the element of, surprise and i know that bay and company produced this and they've i mean he like lives in the transformers uh universe um Mm -hmm. and uh, because he made like 95 transformers movies so it's but he's also kind of taking a step back and um and and he's more of a producer role kind of like he was on bumblebee um yeah what i heard like after the screening there was a q a and cooley was there and um lorenzo di bonaventura was there as to speak for pr- production and mm-hmm. yeah i mean they did mention michael bay and they mentioned having his support but just the the conversation he really didn't do a lot to drive this film other than you know put his name on it which sometimes is all they need to do yeah, just put that um, but yeah this there, really baby. is not his film and yeah. he's he's really handed off no, that's good. I passed and, the torch, I guess. And, you know, and and honestly, too, for for the Transformer series to kind of go back to its roots, which is animated feature, it it feels right. Um, I mean, Karen, I don't know if you've seen Wild Robot, or I mean, obviously we've all seen Inside Out too. Um, but I don't know where you think potentially if this is a a nominee or could be a player in animated feature with that long with that short list later in the year. Honestly, I really do think this is one to watch out for. I really okay. do think it could be a player. And I mean, the thing about this being an animated movie is if you look at especially the mo- more recent Transformers films, at least half, probably two thirds of each of those movies is animated anyway. They just don't call it that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, there it's like, oh, it's live action, but it's really not. So it made sense to make this as a fully animated film because there's no human characters in it. It's actually the first Transformers property with no human characters. So really? Yeah. Yeah, Well, it takes place billions of years before Earth existed. So (laughs) that's true. Okay. You know, there weren't humans yet. (laughs) Well, maybe there was a third act twist I didn't know about, Karen. Come on. (laughs) Let me out here. That's Um, for the sequel. (laughs) Exactly. Transformers 2. Um. They write themselves, folks. Uh, Transformers 1 in theaters right now. Uh, Before we get into the substance, which was an audience award winner for the Midnight Madness uh, winner over at TIFF. Dan, uh, I know that we just did an awards episode kind of wrapping up TIFF and everything. um, But I wanted to get a a quick reaction from you just on one film in particular. Because I know that everyone's we've had opinions on the podcast about Amelia Perez and we've had ones about Anora who were the, the audience award winners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we don't have anyone that's actually seen or talked about life of Chuck, the Mike okay. Flanagan film. And I, and since I do have you here and I know it's a yeah. week, week since, but I, I wanted to get sort of your reaction because it won and we, <laughs> it won the audience award and that's a big mm-hmm. deal. Yeah. Uh, we obviously talked about myself and Eric and Sophia. We talked about how like, it doesn't have a distributor. It also feels like maybe if it doesn't get picked up, that stat seems like it's going to be potentially broken, but we haven't seen it. So we don't know you have seen it. I know you were very mm-hmm. high on it. Uh, can you just kind of like talk about your feelings on the film real quick and then address the elephant in the room, which is the awards part of it as well. So this movie, I was not expecting what this movie was going into it. Um, even knowing that it was Mike Flanagan and knowing that it's based off a Stephen King short story that I had not read, but you know, read about what it was about, I was not prepared for like 
the specifics of it. The mm. the overall tone of it is very existential, but very kind of light and easy. It's almost like a bedtime story, it feels like. Mm. Um, and it has this really ethereal score, especially during the first part of it. Um, but what got me was in the second chapter. It's told in three chapters, basically going backward in time, tracing the life of Chuck from when he's uh, dying or dead to very when he was very young. Mm. And the middle section, which is when he's sort of like in middle age, uh, there is this dance sequence that just takes place on a sidewalk that is the most joyous thing I think I've seen in a theater in a, a, a long time. It, it almost immediately put a smile on my face. And by the time it was over, I was, I, the audience applauded. And this was at a press screening. Like that oh. doesn't happen very no, often. It's very rare. And it's just, it's, the music, it's a girl who's just like drumming on the street and uh, Tom Hiddleston just all of a sudden just starts dancing to what she plays and he dances and starts improvising and then she plays with him and starts improvising and he brings in someone else to dance with him and it's it really just, it's a classic musical theater dance sequence but it's not in a musical mm. and it works beautifully. And that got me just like so smiling and so happy and so joyous. And then in the third act, there is another one that takes place at a prom that by the end I was in tears. It is the, this movie. I did not expect it to be about, the so much about the arts and how um, fulfilling they can be to your soul in a way. And there is this in really, really incredible scene in the third section after this beautiful, gorgeous, like make me smile through tears dance at a prom or mark hamill just has one of the most well-written monologues that i've ever heard and when i say the most well-written it is like these are things that as a young man who was very into the arts and performing and dance specifically i have heard everything that he has said in this monologue place like put differently obviously but it, the way it's written and the way he performs it i my jaw dropped and was on the floor and I it really really took me out okay. right. <laughs> and it's it was my favorite thing that I saw on the ground at the festival my second favorite thing that I saw as part of the festival overall um it's just really beautifully done I mm -hmm. thought it's just really it's a small story about you know life and the things that you can do you know, mm -hmm. in, in your life with your imagination and other things. And I, it really spoke to me on a very deep personal level. And I was, I was so glad that it placed in first for the audience award. Cause it means that I wasn't the only one. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so just real quick, not having to, you know, go too heavy into it, Dan, yeah. but it it doesn't have it again it doesn't have a distributor it but it does it has uh, it is a genre film obviously and, mm -hmm. and it is <laughs> it's ish i guess you could say ish. um but um and also this a stephen king adaptation mm -hmm. um which flanagan is very much known for he's done a couple mm -hmm. 
himself. Um, if this was to get a distributor, do you could you see this being a, a movie that enters the race, like films that have won this award before, or do you feel like what some felt like, which is that Mike Flanagan has a huge following and a lot of fans, mm -hmm. and hasn't really been celebrated so for his fans that were very eagerly anticipating it and were there at the festival. Uh, they swayed the vote for their guy, which, which can happen too. I mean, like, like you can call that what it is, sure. um, but, but also realistically looking at it too, does it seem like a film that could be in the consideration of somebody takes care of it the right way? So that, I think that is the key. If it gets yeah. a good distributor that knows how to Play it right i think mm -hmm. it absolutely could but i think that there's a very low ceiling for how many nominations it can actually get yeah um it because it was one of those movies that really does like sort of touch your heart and soul and touch mm -hmm. something deep inside you which we all know if a movie makes grown men cry it can get a best picture nomination that's that's the ticket and it can do that but the things that go along with that it's basically i I think, and I've been saying this since I saw it, that like if you get even a halfway decent distributor, like you would have to work to fuck up the supporting actor nomination for Mark Hamill because okay. he has he's beloved in the industry. He's Luke Skywalker has not had a role this good outside of the many vo voiceover performances that he's mm -hmm. done that have been fantastic and he gets that really big meaty monologue in the third act that is just the linchpin of the whole movie if you like this movie you like him you're probably going to vote for him so maybe but like it, a like a ceiling of it's on its best is, day on its best day is a picture Supporting actor, adapted screenplay, score. Okay. So almost the American fiction round. Yeah. Minus the lead actor. Just swapping out supporting for lead. Yeah. Well, no, or, that did no, get it. Sterling, Sterling K. Brown, Brown did get in there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'd say that, like, if you get a really good distributor, Flanagan has a chance for director, but I don't know that love for the movie would necessarily bring him along when there are so much bigger directors. Some bigger names, yeah. yeah. No, but it does feel like. I mean, it also could just be a lone screenplay now. Too. It, it could. It could. If somebody lone screenplay them. or lone supporting actor. It it really depends on what picks it up. The yeah. the issue, the biggest issue, and I've heard spoken to a few people on the ground who saw this and agreed is that like it looks like a direct to streaming movie mm. it has that kind of digital gloss to it that sheen a, a lot yeah. that is just like looks like a streaming original so, so perfect for netflix I, I, <laughs> honestly like give it having seen it like it feels more like an apple original honestly mm -hmm. but given flanagan's current relationship with netflix and amazon i would be surprised if amazon didn't want to s build that relationship and yeah pick it up. they do they do also though have a an, an, i mean that's the thing i mentioned on that show was like these dance cards are getting really full for a lot of people mm -hmm. and they have yeah. nickel boys and they have challengers and they have a bunch of other stuff over at MGM has a huge slate this year. And Netflix is, yeah. is, you know, I mean, they just got Maria um, pre Telluride during Venice. They have Amelia Perez, you know, they have their documentaries, they have their animated features that <laughs> they have a ton of stuff. Um, so it also just sadly might be a year. Either I mean it could get also pushed to next year too, which it, is what we've seen well before. Could. Yeah. Um, but it also could just sadly be a film that uh break the stat breaks. Karen, did you want to say something real quick? Or... No. Oh, okay. I thought I thought I thought Karen no, was I mean, leaning I didn't... in. <laughs> no, I just I'm I'm just so you have you have my full attention. I'm just <laughs> hanging on your every word. <laughs> uh, I'm uh I'm excited for it though. Uh I do I have a weird feeling we're going to hear some more reactions this coming week uh, while there's a little film festival going on in Austin that loves genre. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if we heard maybe some rumblings there. If not, then I mean, then it will only have a TIFF presence for the most part, which um, 
you know, does also scream for maybe next year while all these other festivals have their slates already filled out too. Um, all right. Now, now we have stuff on life of Chuck out there. So everybody, you know, now you, now, you know, now, you know, it's a great movie and <laughs> you'll check it out when you see it. Speaking of great movies, let's talk about the substance. That's what we're really here to talk about. Today. Oh boy. We're here to pump it up. <laughs> we're here to talk about it. We're going to inject our opinions into this debate. Um, this is the movie out of can. This is what it, one of the movies out of can. I feel like the this movie. was this is the only the, movie they showed yeah. at can this year. <laughs> it was the movie. Depending on some people and what they liked and what they didn't like. Yeah, that might have been the correct statement there, Karen, because some people <laughs> didn't like everything there. But this seemed to be one of the most positive reactions out of can. Um, and uh, it's kind of hard to describe other than that it's a new age uh body horror film and uh it stars to me more and Mark Qualley and Dennis Quaid and it has been the talk of film twitter since the moment that screening at a can got out and i know that we've all i mean Dan you were able to see it at TIFF i was able to see it uh at a press screening here recently but Karen actually saw it a couple weeks ago before all of us um, Karen, I don't know if you want to divulge into what you told me, uh, your reaction was to this movie about where it places on your list of films you've seen this year. Um, but Karen for yourself, what do you think of the substance? Uh, well, I will say that when I walked out of the screening after the movie was over, I did not oh. walk out during the movie. No, don't um, do that. <laughs> no, uh, I, called a friend and I said, if this is not my favorite movie of the year, I'm excited to see what is. <laughs> Isn't that the best feeling? It like, really is. <laughs> when you just watch your favorite movie of the year, you're like, oh, I know. Like, what the, I know. Oh, this is it. It's great. Cause like, if I see a better movie than this this year, it's going to be a really good year. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I so I went into this I had heard about it obviously from mm -hmm. Ken but I managed to I didn't watch the trailer I had seen the one poster the 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 one with the scar I guess mm -hmm. um I had seen that poster um the stitches you know, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah but I had no idea what <laughs> this was actually about I avoided everything and I don't even think I necessarily did that on purpose. It just kind of was like, well, I know I'm going to watch it. So I'll just, I'll just experience it when it comes around. And I am so glad that I did that. I don't recommend that for everybody <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> this is, I'm sorry, but this movie is batshit crazy. <laughs> and I even, I think I said on Letterboxd, I'm really tired of how much people overuse the word bonkers, but it, I will totally allow it for this movie <laughs> because it really, it is bonkers. And so I think some people probably would benefit from at least knowing what it is before they go into it. But I'm really glad I went in blind because I got to just have this experience that Maybe I'm going to get a little too personal. I don't know. But uh, as a woman who is not so young anymore, um, I it really spoke to some so many of the things that I have been talking about with my friends about what we're experiencing in life. And so it's very much set in Hollywood. It's very much, you know, attacking this, you know, these ideas and these things that happen specifically in Hollywood, but it resonates so well with just the experience of humans aging and being, you know, being kind of rejected for that. At some point you are really needed and wanted and everybody, you know, values you in some way, but then as soon as they don't feel like they have a need for you anymore, you get cast aside. And I, in, I didn't write the review for awards watch. I wrote it for, for citizen Dame, but in my review, I, I was making the point that the real horror of this, of aging and that this movie shows is that it's not about gray hair or sagging skin or whatever. It's really about being ignored and forgotten and, and becoming invisible, which is very viscerally displayed throughout this film and to me more just does it's the best performance she's ever given yeah no i think she's absolutely great i and i agree with you karen i think it's 
I think it's totally about that. Even I, you know, and even while I was watching it, I was like, I know I'm not a, I, I'm not a woman, but even I was feeling the sort of insecurity as to just how one looks and how one feels, and you know, it was it was a a movie that, you know, I hate also the and you talk about a phrase. Uh, phrases that you hate, Karen. I hate the movie that says, you know, people that say, oh, that's because crawls under my skin. Um, <laughs> but this is like literally a movie that literally crawls out <laughs> of skin. So, like, you can say that, and it was. It will make you crawl out of your skin. Yeah. yeah. And I was, I was sitting there just, uh, listen, this movie is not the most subtle piece of entertainment this year, but just, but that's okay. <laughs> Because, like, sometimes to make the point and also still to have nuance, there is uh, subtlety has to be thrown out the window. And I, and it's uh, uh, the directors, I, I'm going to butcher this last name. How, how do you guys say it? It's, it's, uh, Barja. 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 okay. Her world building in this movie is absolutely perfect. Uh, I, I saw Revenge and her first film, and I thought it was a very good movie um it, it very stylized very confident uh you know third act be damned i was you know a little mixed on third act and whatnot but um and some and some of the just like first director nitpicks you could probably have right this feels way more confident and this feels way more uh meticulous uh even though there is these bombastic over the top situations happening it's the little details, the more I've thought about it, that has made this movie stick with me. It's one of the few films that I've thought about over and over again, and it's also the one. And I think that these are the best movies that we that you can talk about, like Challengers or I Saw the TV Glow, where you're, you want to talk about it with somebody immediately when you're done. And I was dying to do this show. And uh, we're, we're trying to move schedules around just to try to find out how we could talk about it, because I think that it is it's a fascinating examination of also how, you know, no matter your insecurities, either the industry is still going to swallow you up and spit you out. Literally, they don't even have to do it themselves. You'll do it to yourself, which I found to be the most one of the more interesting things about it. Um, and I also think something I can nitpick and then Dan, I'll get to you is rules in a world because for a movie like this rules are very important to establish everything. This movie clearly in an effective, still fascinating way sets up its rules without compromising them until things get elevated and there are consequences to that. And I appreciated that because a lot of movies skip steps in order to get to its resolution here, which to get to the ending of the year, perhaps like, like one of the endings of the year uh, it's up there with the challengers ending for me um, or the final sequence in TV glow. Like I mentioned as just these memorable final shots and moments. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, the more I've thought about it, Cause like when I first talked to Karen about it, I was a little mixed on the end. And then I've thought about it over time. I'm like, yeah, I really, really like it actually. Um, so Dan, mm -hmm. you saw this, you saw this at TIFF. You got to see it with the, I saw this the, at midnight, the midnight madness, the midnight screen, madness. Screen. Which, so you got to see it with oh, all, which I you got so jealous. <laughs> you got to see it in honestly, Dan, the right environment, people eager. Yeah. I will say hungry to see this yeah. movie. And, oh, yeah. uh, and they, I assume, loved it because they gave it the audience award uh, for the Midnight Madness uh, screenings. Uh, I, I, I know you love this movie, Dan. So just go on ahead and talk about this and, and <laughs> tell me what your experience was like and and what do you love about it so much? Like it, I don't think that Tiff could have picked a better Midnight Madness opener this year. It really, I mean, it was sort of so obvious that we were, everyone was expecting it to be the Midnight Madness opener, but it really, it is absolutely perfect for that crowd. But the crazy thing is while watching this movie, that crowd was silent for at least the first half. Really? Like, it was hard to tell if people like were 
if they didn't know how to react or if they were too uncomfortable or just like the movie hadn't really gone all in yet on the things that were going to make the crowd really get up in arms. And it was amazing because it did, once it got past the halfway point and things really start going south, then the audience started to wake up basically. (laughs) And like, they got much more into it, but I tell you, like, I really feel everything that you were saying, Karen, because like for all the body horror on display in this movie, and there's a lot and it is quite skin crawly and (laughs) icky and gross and so squishy (laughs) yes it's so the makeup effect i i don't think i've seen makeup effects this good in a movie in a long time Mm -hmm. they really all feel real but the sequences that made me the most like uncomfortable and squirmy in my seat weren't the body horror sequences at all it was the scene where Demi Moore can't leave the apartment for her date despite like looking like Demi Moore <laughs> like she can't yeah. do it she keeps going back and adjusting and changing her dress and the hair and makeup, adding more makeup lipstick. and taking off makeup oh. and I that and then the other one and this was it started off with a body horror moment but it turned into something completely different when there is I'll say an issue during the taping of Sue's show and they have say like wait what was that go back and watch it show it on the big screen while everyone is standing right in front and staring and then see when you like realize what that show actually is and how it's being filmed and marketed and what people are getting out of it and it's that was what made me so like uncomfortable and squirmy in my seat because like the the predatory nature of this of this industry and that's what she wanted she wanted to have this kind of show and wanted to do this kind of stuff and put herself out there in that way and then you see it and it's just the most exploitative uh crassest version of an exercise show you could ever possibly imagine and it's supposed to be about uplifting women and making them feel good about their bodies and instinct makes you feel horrible well, no i mean i mean dan the actual horror is the dennis quaid character I, I, from oh, the first beginning of it, i mean like one those place, shrimp. those shrimps oh like, my those, god those those juicy those shrimps sh- like th- yeah. there's as much guts and stuff coming out of that shrimp than in the third act i loved this i loved the the opening shot of this movie when uh, not the opening shot but the scene very near the opening when she's walking down that hallway past all the posters of herself throughout the years i love that the production design of this movie is insanely good (laughs) yes the the production design just like ah everything Mm -hmm. but when i knew i loved this movie was that the lens choice for when dennis quaid is at the urinal Mm -hmm. because (laughs) it is so perfectly grotesque Mm -hmm. and i was oh i see you movie (laughs) and i Lot you because that and the way it like moves with him as he shakes it <laughs> off. No, I mean he's I mean, but then that goes Going back to all in. But it Dan, all it goes back in. to what you're saying too, when he gets I mean, the reason why he's he's so slimy <clears throat> in this movie and why Harvey. he's actually the th- thing that's the scariest thing obviously because he's a man, but because of the fact that it's the willingness for him to bend the rules for Sue that he wasn't able to do for Elizabeth, the, and the closeness he gets, I mean, it's no, again, subtlety. The character is named Harvey. Harvey. (laughs) 
the like, humor in this works and the satire works because yeah. of the fact that it's not subtle. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, which absolutely. is, and that's why it ultimately works for me and why it's enriching when you start thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it because of the fact that, you know, the two dangers here are essentially still the thing that women are fighting every single day, which is the insecurities of society and then and and then how that is on them psychologically and then the men in power who are deciding what they believe to be pretty and not pretty it's no coincidence why when the shit hits the fan in the end of the movie it's a man that screams out monster not a woman you know what I mean? And so, and then it all goes downhill from there. And I just think quite those hallway sequences, it, there was just so much. I know we talk a lot. I mean, like there's so like, there's like the world building of this. It, there was, you know, I know that we use this phrase a lot and I think it's really, um, it's really overused for certain movies, but I did feel the style of it within the story and the, the insecurities found in something like Mulholland drive with the specificity of the world building where it feels like, because in a Lynch movie, those movies feel like they're set in period pieces, like a, like a blue velvet, but also still feel like they're happening currently in modern day. And that's what this movie has. It feels like it is a byproduct of the eighties, but yet still feels like it's around and made for now. Right. And then like, actually it's going on right now, but that also just speaks to how 40, 50, 60 years go by and the same problems that Elizabeth was facing then are the same obstacles that Sue is facing. And ultimately they're, they come to a head against one another instead of fighting the actual problems, which I found, I find to be really interesting. And I mean, I think you both are absolutely right. This is a makeup winner in my book. Like, if, like I'm not predicting it, but like in a perfect world, it's done because this is better makeup than like Dune or some mm -hmm. of the bigger films. And also you just know it's done on a microscopic budget comparative to those other films that it would face off in a, in a bake-off. And I'm not going to say that Demi Moore if she ages really terribly like she was, which she won't because she's a goddess and she looks beautiful and everything. But if she aged like her character in the film and the consequences like of that aging happened to her in real life, she looks, she's going to look a lot like Glenn Close. Like she looked a lot like Glenn Close, you know, when she in the cooking, Glenn Close in the deliverance, in the cooking <laughs> sequence, I was like, I see it. I see yep. it. Yep. But the, the chicken thing, leg, yes, was was like, oh, God, oh my God, the chicken leg. <laughs> yeah. Also did look really good. Not going to lie. I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was like well, I just, <laughs> to your point, though, about the time, time and the timelessness of this is I think that there are a lot of, of elements. Obviously, the, the studio itself looks like this homage to the 80s. Her apartment looks very 90s. And then there are so many references to movies from all different time periods. There's like a, a reference to 2001, a space odyssey. There's a reference. There's a very unsubtle reference to the shining. Um, and there's, there's others in there too, that are just kind of blended in where it really does basically just say, this is Hollywood. It's always been Hollywood and it's still Hollywood today. Absolutely. And not just Hollywood. Either. Right. Like it is definitely about Hollywood. And I mm -hmm. love the fact that it just, it is so LA. <laughs> it's very and, LA and it's this like fairy tale-ish mm -hmm. version of LA in, yeah. in a lot of ways, um, especially like where her apartment is. It's like, okay, so that's supposed to be, I guess the Hollywood Hills, but that view <laughs> wouldn't really exist this way. And there's no way that billboard could possibly right. exist. And there's no way where this house was where it is. And in no way it would be an apartment complex. It would, you know, it would most yeah. likely right. be like a mansion up in the hills, mm -hmm. which is and, what and the, even her the, apartment does not look like. They would fit in that building. There's right. too much. There's too much space in that bathroom. Yeah. I'm just going to say like, yeah. like yeah. 
I was thinking about that. And I was a like, random hidden like cubby hole. Yeah, this whole other room. <laughs> yeah, like... no, that she like builds like that's, but that's mm-hmm. like I think that's also too. But the, I I don't know. Maybe this is just me. I, I I but I felt like the building of that room to secure the the sort of the scars and also the the self that you are in a lot of ways yeah. too. And then I, also the what Sue does to her. Mm-hmm. is literally locking her up in a closet like yeah and well, a and betrayal you can, of your body you know yeah I mean? well and you can roll this out as a metaphor for something much more realistic and just say none of this is literal this is basically a metaphor of like plastic surgery and mm-hmm. botox and all of that and so yeah. yes that room is her locking her visions of her images of herself her aging self away and not looking at that, not thinking about it, only drawing from it when she really has to. But by the end, because you and en- you endure so much of this, these procedures, so many of these, these treatments and things, it becomes something monstrous. No, I mean, like I, I, yeah. I was thinking about it in the film because it's hard not to, I think, but I was thinking a lot about, I mean, we're talking about an, you know elizabeth is a is an, a, a woman in her 50s she has an aerobics you know sort of you know that's her career is an aerobics video uh vhs almost on or on demand uh you know instructor um former hollywood star all these awards da 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 da, da. time goes on um and i was thinking a lot of obviously jane fonda was was somebody as mm-hmm. she's someone that has gone into that place of plastic surgery and there are times where you see Jane and she looks better than not and then she has some work done and you're like what are you, you look like a like not even the version the best version of yourself depending on the doctor right it it's it's all about like once you go down that rabbit hole and once you start the literal injections or the it's the, and it's not just what you put in right it's what you also take out yeah. And that's what I think also you're right, Karen, this movie shows is like, if you want, you know, plastic surgery by the end of this, at the end of this watch, it's like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you there. If that's like, maybe, if you're scheduling you an appointment, maybe. Yeah. Cause like, I yeah. think that that's the other thing too, is, is that to chase that, that unobtainable goal of, of whatever you believe to be the perfect beauty there. Like, again, I say there are consequences to that. And usually they're they're detrimental. And when there is a mishap in the film, and I don't want to get too specific because you know everyone's still trying to see this film. Um, though we've done a we've done a good job of dancing around it. Um the consequences start slow, and she has a sense of out, and she doesn't take it because it's it's like most people that do that stuff, they have a taste, and when they get a taste, it's hard to get out. And I think also too the the sort of i mean the idea of say of calling the host body the matrix and having that be a connection and to this as well i was i was thinking a lot about that too and how that movie has been and dan you and i talked about this earlier this year that that movie being a um reclaimed as a as a trans allegory Mm -hmm. and and everything uh in the 25 years since its existence and when I was watching this movie, I was thinking about how this will be claimed and how this will be taken. And the, there's different ways of doing that. I do also know that, that it's, you know, Karen uh, is, is very positive on this film. I know that there were a ton of female critics that were not so positive out of can or, uh, you know, out there about this and that it was, it was giving me a little, little, I it was nervous because, you know, we've seen this happen before where, uh, where films like this, uh, a lot of sadly male critics get to go to these film festivals and get to experience things and they get their opinions out there first. And if it's a deeply f- feminine story, then I kind of have to sit back and be like, is it, is it actually as good as you guys are saying it is? Um, and, um, and so I, I give C- Karen and Alejandro wrote the review up on the site uh, a lot of credit because uh, like it was it's it's great to see these perspectives these more positive perspectives but different perspectives on the film come out over time as well well 
will say too, I mean, it's sitting at 89, as we record this, it's sitting at 89% on Rotten Tomatoes and quite a large number of the people that have gotten to review it now um, are women who That's have good. liked it. So good. good. Yeah. good. It wasn't, that, it wasn't that way at the start. Well, um, and I think we have to look at who was at Cam. That's Mm-hmm. Fair. that's so, no that's fair that's yeah. a fair when you no. don't have a lot of women even being there in the first place then the percentage of of favorable to disfavorable isn't gonna also, be like, reflective of the actual population just female directors in the lineup too because she was one of very few mm-hmm. she usually uh, in the, well in, in, in usually are very few, yeah, yeah they're very few mm-hmm. <laughs> well yeah no that that is sadly true Yes, uh, sadly true. There's one other thing I would like to talk about. Yes. Um, with we have regards, time. that's to... what we're that's what a podcast we're here to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I so I think that the way this film starts and ends, oh. um, is to me the best short film of the year. Yeah, Are you talking the life about the... of a Hollywood star on the yes. Walk of Fame was yeah. so incredibly well done. And it it moved me to tears. Like I was going into this, going like, "Oh my gosh!" Like this is just, and I I just I thought that the way that it it goes from, I mean, showing the process of how a star on the Walk of Fame is made that was pretty really cool. cool really? But really cool. also just showing how it's like it starts as this big celebration. It's a big deal. It's exciting, and then eventually it becomes something that you know people walk over. They don't pay attention to. They spill their food on it and the street sweeper has to clean it up. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's interesting to see how, you know, I mean, so many people come to Hollywood and they are so excited to see the Walk of Fame. I just had a friend in town recently who had never been out here before and she wanted to see it. And so that was the first thing we did the first day she got here. And I was just thinking about how we treat that as, you know, we're enshrining people on the Walk of Fame. It's you have made it, you've arrived, you have this honor. And eventually it just becomes you just become a name on the pavement and nobody thinks two two thoughts about you and nobody even knows who you are. People are and literally walking over you exactly all day tracking their <laughs> dirt over you. Like it Yep. I mean I so thought the, I thought the brilliance of that too was like there's a line of dialogue when someone's walking by like, wasn't she in that one thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or that that's actually more like time coded than the like expansion of time or from that because it's like when you're really popular and that star goes up is your is kind of for a young actress is your peak moment you're probably getting an award or having your pr- big premiere that night and then over a five to ten year span you become to the average person that goes and visits los angeles right karen you become wasn't she in that one thing that I saw like a while ago? Like, whatever happened to what's her name? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they don't make, you know what? I, somebody else's stars over here. You know, they, that was a better act. And it becomes these really like weird conversations. And then, yeah, you just become like someone's running late to work and they drop their food or they spill their drink or whatever the case may be. And, and then based off of how you, then how literally Hollywood treats you, the system, because that's how the public treats you. The yeah. ending is how the system treats you. And mm-hmm. also how some people treat themselves as well, too. You then become irrelevant and you become washed up and you become discarded. And they, but both the public and the system continued to move on and that's the sad thing is like you know i was okay i'm not a big fan of this movie but i saw this clip uh it's it's the, the best movie part. you're about to talk about not the, the yeah, no, not the substance the movie you're about to talk about <laughs> it's a little worried. the movie i watched the clip the other day because gene smart won another emmy for hacks and it was on youtube of the scene in babylon where she's talking to brad pitt mm about just the nature of it's one of the best kind of you know just three minutes out of that movie yeah it's the best movie see the movie and it perfectly also encapsulates the ending of this movie of like we're gonna and and weirdly it it encapsulates how at times hollywood treated to me more 
and how she was, you know, denigrated for taking a movie like striptease or, you know, how, uh, men treated her and audience members treated her terribly for taking a role like GI Jane, you know what I mean? And how she then had a family and that's not how the, you know, the system doesn't want to work like that because it's like, you're supposed to make movies, movies, movies. You're not supposed to have a life. You're not supposed to have like a family or something outside of this. You're always supposed to be a part of the machine and you can't have that balance. And especially at the time in which she's, you know, coming up and she was part of the, 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 the brat pack. Right. You know, she's a part of this, this, you know, giant wave of generation. She's probably the most popular person to come out of that in terms of longevity of an actress, I would say most celebrated, I would say. Um, actress you know, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe her or Rob Lowe. Right. Probably. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. Um, so it's really also interesting to from just a perspective of looking at her career through Elizabeth and seeing how they mirror each other. They're not a full carbon copy, but it's an experience that she feels. And that's what she's able to bring into this performance and why it's so great. But also as much as we're going to give the praise to Demi Moore, we have to give praise to Margaret Qualley, who's absolutely fantastic in this movie. And I have, I've been on record, but I'm going to say it again. I have bought all the Margaret Qualley stock. I can, I think she is a movie star. I think she has presence on screen. I did not like kinds of kindness, but I loved everything about her in that movie. And I swear to God, I wish she had replaced Emma stone because that movie would have been 10 times better because she's right now, 10 times the better actress. <laughs> and I just think that she's absolutely fantastic in this movie and literally goes toe to toe with more as the best part about this thing. I love her in this so much. Mm -hmm. She is, she is youth personified in every way the impetuousness of it the inability to listen the self-centeredness the and the the beauty and the the cunningness and you know all the other things that all the good and bad things we associate with youth she embodies them it in this performance th throughout the movie, all these different facets, I, she's really, really brilliant. And it's so stylized and such a smart performance. I, yeah, I am I'm, I'm with you, Ryan. I bought f all the Margaret Qualley stock I could after Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And she has proven me, right? That has paid off every, <laughs> with every film she's made, honestly. And this <laughs> is just like her, kind of crowning achievement so far i yeah the confidence she brings to the role the disdain she has for elizabeth oh, yes it's it's so especially like i mean my understanding of the story is that they're supposedly sharing a consciousness and there is suggestion that they both know what's going on but i'm still one not cannot entirely live without sure the, how that's supposed one cannot to work. live without the other yeah right and they know enough about the other to make things move forward but there's also a lot that they don't know and that they assume about the other that mm -hmm. makes it that that leads to some really great moments of total misunderstanding and and judgment on both sides and um, yeah, they they neither could do quite what they do without the other one. Yeah, um, yeah. And it's it's incredible. And I have to say, it's also a career, I would say, career best, maybe definitely high up there for Dennis Quaid, too. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I, I mean, right up there. it's also really um, maybe this is just me, but, you know, we talk about sort of like, I guess, the the meta contextuality between the character that, you know, of Moore in, in Elizabeth and. I do feel a little bit of that between Sue and Quali. I mean, her being married to I mean, one of the biggest record producers on the planet uh, and, and being and a part of a machine and seeing that on the other side of it day in and day out of what happens to these pop girls in the Antonoff machine is uh, it is very something. I will well, say, and, you know, and being the daughter of a, Andy McDowell Dow, who yep, had that, her and a, day and was a, considered a great and her father was a former model yeah exactly. i mean it's like it's, she it, knows this shit yeah it's 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 very much it, like she's taken a backseat obviously to the praise that more has gotten i've seen some q and a's and she's really just very grateful uh to be a part of the process but there's some sneaky greatness to this performance mm. that is yeah it's again what more has it's 
they've lived it and it feels like that in those characters that's what makes them so special and yeah there's 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 a certain vainness to sue that she has to then breeds jealousy from elizabeth and uh, and they both have their ways of hurting one another you know one is to literally suck the life out of the other and the other is to what is the most terrifying thing to a young person carbs you know what i mean so like <laughs> it's like literally food you know what i mean so um i i thought that that was again a really funny observation and and um i don't want to get too into the details but the ending um <laughs> the, i loved the ending it's because grown was, on me and uh yeah dan talk about it I, I loved it because when she built that room for elizabeth i was like oh she's locking herself in the closet she's hiding away the ugly thing this is like twisted picture of dorian gray and then the end is like well what if ever the mods the picture became real Mm -hmm. and everyone then that was what was walking around and it's but it's done in the most unexpected like entertaining as fuck way but at the same time like there is and and hearing them talk about in the Q&A after the Midnight Madness screening that is underneath that makeup at the end it is both of them i was gonna ask you about that i was wondering yeah it is it is literally margaret crawley in the front and demi moore in the back and the whole thing was put on both of them yeah that's amazing but there is the demi moore part of that makeup that is an image and i don't want to spoil it because we're you know we're steering clear of that but that particular part is an image that i will never be able to get out of my brain from the demi moore side of it it is horrifying it it truly it because even the reveal of it as as it's coming is yeah it's so horrifying but then once you see that it's like oh my what has she done to herself yeah (laughs) and is really the the horror of that frozen i i did laugh immensely at the (laughs) The disguise of that, yes. of that character. <laughs> I was like, it wasn't a disguise. Oh, it was. A, was it a disguise? I mean, like she the was getting the, dressed up for her big night. <laughs> sure the the taping of Demi Moore's picture on the on, on the was... fa- that's what got me, Karen. I'm like, sit, okay. I'm like, I'm like, this is awesome. Like I was, I, I, it was so. <laughs> silly and i loved it i was just like okay i get it but no like to dan's point it is a very much i felt that that dorian grayness of of the this is the only way now to get perfection is through the past now through pictures and um and yeah and then it leads to i still don't think the heavy metal music choice is the right choice um (laughs) but like that's just my nitpick um, but, uh, but I, I still, I, I think it's an insane way to end a movie and it's playing it on thick. That's it, why it is. It yeah. is literally, like, literally the only way they could have, exactly. Thick. Only way they could have laid it on thicker was using Marilyn Manson's the beautiful people. <laughs> I was thinking like, no, I, th- I thought, couldn't get the right. There was Probably. another, there was another song I was thinking. I, I was honestly, I was just thinking they were going to use the pump it up yeah. part during there. And I, th- and, and I was like. I was kind of more for that too. Like, you know, like, like the, the, the theme song for her show Mm -hmm. being used there at that moment. I thought that that would have been just as good, but it's a nitpick. It's nothing, it's nothing that can hurt the overall quality of the film, but Karen, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a wild ending, right? It is wild. And I loved it. (laughs) (laughs) Every time it just went further with the body or (laughs) the the tiff audience, like the, that reaction was so incredible we were all just in for the ride at that point and everything that like Coralie clearly had us all in the palm of her hand and knew that she would and just played it i love the um i'm not gonna call it a fake out but the kind of 
dream sequency part of that yes uh, a ending bunch, yeah. because yeah. it perfectly sets up like what if that is how they react <laughs> like when she actually gets out there like i would not put it past this movie at that point to go like full on with the satire and say ah oh, yes beautiful <laughs> it's so beautiful never seen something so before but when they it turns and it's like like ryan said Mm -hmm. monster and but oh what happens is just so it's it's so wild that it's satisfying and that that final moment that final image of this movie is just it is what chef's kiss perfection as far as i'm concerned they could not have ended it any any better I was in a critic screening and I saw it and uh, somebody it was, there was only six of us in the screening oh, and, wow. and, um, and uh, well, it was like, it was like random day out of the week. Um, uh, and um, not, and I think there was another screening going on at the same time or something. Mm. And uh, I was talking with somebody beforehand and we all went to our seats and I got up and he goes, what the hell was that? I said everything they. <laughs> I said, everything. I, think that, yeah. I think that was everything they said it was, and then some. And he was, yeah. and he looked at me and went, "Yeah, it was, and it ruled." So it wasn't a, it wasn't a, like a bad way. It was just like, it was like, how do you yeah. describe that? Like you know, mm-hmm. it's a, it's an experience to go through, and um, yeah, yeah. I, I I highly recommend everybody go check it out. I highly recommend uh, try to go in. Hopefully, if you're listening to this, we haven't done a terrible job at spoiling it, but it, I think we've done a pretty good job dancing around I it. Feel I feel like, so, I'm yeah. going to say, I feel like this is an experience movie. I Like, I, I know I had said that flow. I'm glad I went in blind, but I don't think knowing, knowing the things plot are gonna be, we'll or knowing what's going to happen. Yeah, because you yeah, still, you like, s- there's still, like, the movie eases you into it. Like, I think it really that, does. Like, yeah, like it takes I know a that, bit before like, you get yeah. to the point. I know the movie's mm-hmm. two hours and twenty minutes, and sometimes that could be like a detriment. And I mean, for Dan, that's like two thirty at night, three o'clock in the morning when it he's was. Up and it was. Yeah, it was bad. I don't know but... how Dan's still here. Um, <laughs> or, did you not sleep that night? Um, <laughs> I got, I think, maybe three hours. I was going to say, oh welcome, my gosh. welcome to the Toronto not, International. It's not the Festival. best way to start. <laughs> Dan's better than me. I don't. I don't. I can't do. That. I, anyway. I, I always allow myself one midnight film at TIFF because it's you want to experience it with that audience. There's going to be at least one. But I, I love that this movie, a movie this angry, mm-hmm. is that entertaining that it had a midnight madness audience at TIFF like roaring. No, it's like <laughs> a it's like a shot of adrenaline or a shot of fluid. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean, from from the spinal column, if you know what I mean. God, I... Um, you know what I mean. But uh... oh. <laughs> good job well, keeping all the details. Subtle. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm I know. Talking right? around it. Anyway, <laughs> um, it's in theaters. Go see it. It's still an experience uh, worth seeing. It's one of the movie events of uh, of the year, in my opinion. Dan Bear, can you tell everybody where they can find you and all your work on the internet? You can find me obsessing over the packaging of the substance on Twitter at Dance and Dan on film and on Letterboxd at Dance and Dan. Did you get a package? I did not get a package, but like the everything about how they package the substance in this movie, I was like, that is the most genius production design of the year. Super meticulous, like the rest of this thing. Perfect. Oh, random deep. Perfect. Random details too, by the way. The phone number that she has to call to mm-hmm. place her order, um, it starts with a 909 area code, which is out in the Inland Empire. And I love that it's like this place that's detached from Los Angeles. It's like kind of people yeah. forget it's there and it's just like way out, and which is not where she has to actually go for the order, but it right. totally is like again, yeah, it's in- just such a good detail. But the, and love that when she goes to pick up her thing, there are only there have all these boxes there but there are only two that have numbers on them yeah only two people are taking the substance it's, well it's her and it's her and maybe some that else. guy yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah the doctor the doctor mm-hmm. um <laughs> 
Karen, um, also Inland Empire, uh, David Lynch movie. Um, Karen, can you tell everybody where they can find you and all your work on the internet? Well, you can find me in the Inland Empire because that's where I live. There you go. <laughs> but please don't. Um... <laughs> Leave Karen alone. She just wants to live and go to her screening. Let her live her life. <laughs> um, but a better place to follow me would be on the internet. And uh, yeah, you can find some of my some of my work at Ward's Watch. You can also find me on my other podcasts, Citizen Dame and The Watch and Talk. And you can find me on social media at Karen M. Peterson pretty much everywhere. Go follow her on social media. Especially social- letterbox. I'm trying to build up yeah. my letterbox. Yeah, but social distance away from her. All right. Just come on, guys. <laughs> yeah. I'll know better than that. <laughs> uh you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterbox. Yes, Letterbox. Ryan McQuaid 77. Uh, you can find me on awards watch where I do all my work here. Uh, and I'll be in New York. So, and Dan will be in New York and we'll be doing NYFF the next, I'll be doing it the next two weeks, even though this festival goes on for, uh, nine weeks, 10 weeks. It's actually last year's hasn't ended. Um, and, um, so if you see us, uh, say hi, Uh, or mostly just say hi to Dan and I'll be like, Oh, Hey, hi. Uh, Um, and, um, uh, uh, if you like, I almost lost my train of thought. If you like podcasts, we do one every Thursday. It's called Director Watch. This week, we are doing Night of Cups with our great friend, uh, Jesse Nussman, uh, talking about that film in Terrence Malick's movie series. Uh, I'm going to tease it now. We tease it on the show. You're going to want to listen to that episode. There's going to be a treat at the end of that episode, and you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, and so iTunes, Spotify, five-star reviews, go to the website, sign up for the newsletter. It's the place that we you know, can get all the news reviews, interviews, and everything sent to you all in one place. Uh, next week, we're going to be back here and uh, we're going to be talking about, Karen, what are we going to be talking about next week? We're going to be talking about Francis Ford Coppola's latest film, Megalopolis. Maybe talk a little bit about our favorite director passion projects. Maybe talk a little bit about Francis Ford Coppola's best movies, something along those lines, but we're definitely going to talk about Megalopolis. So stay tuned for that. But until then we will see you all next time.